and welcome to Spotlight with Sandhya. 85 to 90 percent of healthcare in India is provided by the private health sector. And in today's episode, we are going to be looking at what the private hospitals and nursing homes are doing in Bangalore during the pandemic. Not a single family has been spared during this horrendous second wave of COVID-19. They're searching desperately for beds, for drugs, for ICU and for vaccines. Private hospitals are criticized for not giving enough beds and for charging exorbitant costs for treatment. But let's get real. Private hospitals are for-profit businesses. If not, how would they take care of their establishment costs, their salaries and their running expenses? What is being questioned here is not their regular profits, but the abnormal profits that's being counted on during these times. Is this the time to be saving lives or looking at the profits? To answer these questions, joining us today is Dr. H.M. Prasanna, President of PANA, the Private Hospitals and Nursing Homes Association of Karnataka. So, you know, there's a strong feeling that uh, private hospitals should reserve only 2% of their beds for trauma, emergency and uh, chronic patients who need dialysis or uh, cancer treatment. And all the rest should be used for COVID care. After all, you know, people are so scared of going to hospital these days that hardly any elective surgeries are being conducted. And you've seen in Bombay that uh, I think about 75 to 80 percent of beds have been given to the government for central allocation by all the private hospitals. Do you think something like this could be done in Bangalore? And if the government were to issue such an order, would the private hospitals association cooperate? Uh, see, first of all, I had come to the bed sharing with the government. Already, Karnataka government has notified 50% of all the beds in the private sector for COVID care under the central pool referred by the government of Karnataka across all hospitals. And 75% beds of the medical colleges in private have been taken over by the government for COVID care treatment. So already we are working with the government, we are okay with it, we are cooperating. In the remaining 50% what the private sector has, we have to treat the private COVID care patients and also the non-COVID care patients. So certain hospitals have made that 40 and 10% for non-COVID. Some smaller hospitals have become totally COVID hospitals because you can't uh, mix both COVID and non-COVID. Only the big chain hospitals who have different blocks are still running with non-COVID care. And conducting elective surgeries doesn't warrant now because this is like a warlike situation. Saving as many lives as possible is the most important thing. We need to give bed to the needy people, whoever needs oxygenated bed, who needs medical care. So every bed is precious. They should not be wasted for conducting some non-critical elective surgery. So right now, the entire uh, infrastructure and our resources are targeted towards saving COVID care patients and as many lives as possible. Okay, but where are the beds, doctor? I know recently, uh, FANA launched uh, Find My Bed portal. So it should be easier for people to find beds. There don't seem to be any beds. And is it streamlined with what the government has? Or we, let's talk about Bangalore with what the BBMP has. Because we still see people reaching out to social media, WhatsApp, phone calls to find a bed somewhere. Isn't the whole purpose of having a centralized dashboard or a portal to make it easier for people who are under stress at such a time? See, you have to check, uh, like if you see the CHBMS portal of the government, there are more than 1000 beds available for COVID care patients, even in the private, in the medical colleges. See, right now, the demand has changed. The shift is now more of critical care beds are required. All the patients who are coming are coming with the low oxygen levels. So they all need a high dependency unit or a ICU care beds, which is in short supply. If you see, there are only about 1,200 or maximum 1,400 ICU beds available across both government and the private pool. But the demand is for about 5,000 beds. That's where people are running from post to pillar, reaching out to NGOs, reaching out to the bureaucracy to get them a bed. Getting a normal, even an oxygenated bed uh, in uh, private or public is not an issue now. 
there are enough beds available only the shortage is in the critical care beds so uh, and we sir we started a search my bed uh, portal see we have nearly about 4000 beds displayed there but the scenario is all the beds are full and patients are waiting in every hospital er emergency rooms to get a bed as soon as somebody gets discharged they are allocated a bed immediately but since two days certain easing of uh, this stress has been seen our portal also is showing about 15 to 20 beds available now so once the case load comes you will have enough beds available but right now the situation is in every private hospital emergency room there are three to five patients waiting to get admitted how long will it take to increase the capacity of these icu beds in hospitals or set up new centers with just icu beds see all private sector has a capacity to increase the icu beds and the karnataka government is also willing to help monetarily to increase the number of beds a nodal officer has been appointed to assist private hospital in terms of monetary and uh, infrastructure help but only the uh, main drawback right now is we can increase the number of icu beds the infrastructure can be put in within few days but there are no human resources available to uh, work in this icu that is the main crux of the problem we don't have trained icu nurses we don't have enough number of intensivists to work see normal nurses cannot work in an icu setup the scenario is totally different the demand is different normal duty doctors can't manage an icu it will be a disaster so that's where the problem is we have as a government to help us in getting human resources which some training to work in the icus but the government is telling see we will provide you anything you ask ma- machinery you ask you ask anything in money but don't ask human resources that's where we are stuck unless we get trained human resources see now we need to create a national pool of trained uh, workers who are required in icu karnataka alone is unable to supply the demand for icu nurses and icu doctors so we should create a national pool utilize them from across the states where there is no workload for icu doctors and icu nurses this the time has come where the prime minister or the pm has to look into this create a national pool of critical care workers that is a need of the so i have two questions here doctor one is that because uh, the elective surgeries have come down or almost stopped in several hospitals very senior surgeons and very senior staff have been fired or they have been given very drastic pay cuts so they might as well they feel that that might they might as well stay at home don't you think that these people can be incentivized to come and help out and do their covid duty and it's not going to happen if they paid peanuts right they are going to be putting their lives at risk so is there something that the private hospitals can do engage in a dialogue with such doctors and surgeons and get them to be here and second you talked about the shortage of the nurses so i know uh, myself that i have experienced that several nursing staff have moved on to greener pastures they've gone abroad they've gone to the gulf they've some have even gone to the west indies because they're being paid more than 2 lakhs here they don't even get 30000 rupees and even that sometimes gets delayed so do you think the lack of payment uh, is a big factor in the nursing staff leaving and do you think there is something that you can help out with by offering better payment and incentivizing all the fired surgeons and doctors to come back to work definitely see your first suggestion is very valid there are so many specialists uh, other than the physicians and uh, there are surgeons who have enough uh, training they even can intubate patients uh, they know certain amount of uh, ventilator settings and these people are easy to train for our requirements uh, that already many hospitals have been doing because the non uh, like physician uh, cadre who are reluctant to work in covid scenario and people who are above 50 with poor morbidities we don't want them to work in the covid wards but the younger lot with other specialties who are sitting idle without any work these that's what i told you we need to create a talent pool of all this including the doctors and nurses and uh, we need to work because we are not at over with the second wave in karnataka and we need to get ready for the third wave so it's a welcome suggestion already many hospitals are doing this even uh, i told this in one of the government meetings also even in the government medical colleges there are so many specialists who are not even coming to the hospital they are getting paid so we need to call them all for this emergency duties 
and at least they can do teleconsultation, guide the youngsters and uh, bring down the mortality rate in COVID care. Second is the payment to the nurses. See, this is a, a vicious cycle what is happening in the country. I should start with, uh, for example, if you see Aishman Bharat scheme, which has been launched by a prime minister a few years back, the packages and the rates provided in the Aishman Bharat are peanuts, which don't even sometimes cover the cost of the medication. So the government at one place is telling we will pay you only uh, peanuts for your services. Other this one is the demand for the nurses who are highly qualified and trained. Unless we pay them and keep them in good books and make them work, we are unable to reach out to the masses. But to pay them, we need to get paid well. So these kind of schemes across various states have spoiled the uh, prospects of the nurses. That's why they are going into the greener pastures. You be uh, sensitive to these things. You call the stakeholders do a costing of what is exactly to be paid. There are various agencies take help of the NGOs. Then you arrive at a proper packages. Then the hospitals are also doing well. Then they can pay well to their nurses. Even the insurance is taken a leave from Aishman Bharat. They are also bullying the hospitals. They are putting constraints on the treatment protocols. No, no, we are going to pay only this much. So hospitals are not earning adequately, but they are forced to pay more uh, the whole system will crumble. Okay, so uh, if the government says, like in Mumbai, give not just 50%, give me 75% of your beds, are you prepared to give it since you represent the private hospitals here in Bangalore? Are you people prepared to give it? Is, the, is, is there a hesitation okay. because whatever the government is paying you right now is not enough? Of course, we have uh, we have put in our reservations to the government. If you want to take out 75%, it won't work for the private sector. You can't sustain the system. How much are they covering the well hospitals, uh, Dr. Prasanna? How much Madam? is the BBMP paying the hospitals per bed and there is a yeah. see, per bed they see, I'll tell you per bed they are paying five thousand rupees for a oxygenated bed for HDU, they pay about seven and a half thousand rupees. For a non-ventilator bed, they bed they pay about nine thousand, and now they have increased the ventilator bed charges slightly about thirteen thousand and odd. But we are spending nearly about ten thousand rupees per bed on the in the private sector. We subsidize this cost, thinking that okay, fifty percent let us give it to the government and subsidize these beds. We can't subsidize that rate to the entire uh, fraternity, and we will not be able to see pay our staff, pay our doctors, then oxygen rates have gone up. The disposable items required in the hospital, the rates have gone up by 10 times. So you can't sustain it. So the government has to under, uh, handle this very carefully. You see the sustainability of this ecosystem. You, uh, you disturb it too much, then uh, the managements will be forced to shed the hospitals rather than running with a huge loss. So now I want to touch upon, you know, the treatment that's being given or not being given to the COVID patients. You know, way back in February, I remember reading an interview where you had warned that the COVID cases were on the rise and people who had tested positive should be cautious and not self-medicate at home, but they have to come to the hospitals. But now we're in this situation that there are not enough beds and now people are being told you stay at home and you self-medicate. Now in a country like ours and in, even in a you know advanced city like ours, most of the people are uneducated. They are not able to monitor their oxygen level. And two, this corona is such a dangerous disease. Even I'm, I've heard from patients that it creates a brain fog. So they're not even able to come to grips with what's happening. And by the time the oxygen level starts dipping to 70 and 80, and they start running around desperately looking for a bed, it's too late. So they should be where a doctor or a medical team is able to monitor them. By the time it dips, goes below 95 itself. Am I right, doctor? So why yes, you're right. can below. this happen? Two, they've set up this triage systems now. Are they working? Is it of any help? Or is it just a desperate need to do some action? Or is it of any help? See, you are right. Uh, from February itself, I have been uh, talking in various forums and telling the government that uh, we are already at the verge of starting a second wave. We should be careful. And I always been uh, uh, preaching this. Even now, I tell whatever is the number of cases, 
see all patients need to have one at least consultation with a doctor either a tele consultation as soon as they test positive and patient should be encouraged to test themselves as early as possible once they start having even minor symptoms because i have seen even people who had mild headache and very little fever tested positive so these early uh, testing and treatment resulted in complete cure where we are going wrong is in the first wave the government had a very clear cut policy in karnataka all tested patients were monitored by the healthcare workers they used to get a call every other day to find out how they are doing whether they are taking the medicine their oxygen levels are normal there was a very good robust uh, monitoring system this wave all that has been thrown to the wind there is no monitoring and the government or the everybody is telling stay at home even if you test positive that's where we are going wrong see at least about 10% of this active cases become complicated they have lung involvement so once they start like you told they are becoming hypoxic they start running for a bed they all need icu beds we don't have adequate number of beds so the same government is telling you stay at home don't come to the hospitals for treatment but if somebody gets into a problem where are we we are not keeping up a promise of providing a bed to that particular patient so we need to bring back this luckily yesterday our uh, deputy chief minister dr ashwath narayan has told all people in the rural sector and in the slums they should not go for a home isolation we have adequate number of covid care centers in the government in the private they can be accommodated there they need to be monitored and whoever is in the home isolation even in the other uh, urban areas they need to be tele monitored they need to be treated proactively i call it as a proactive treatment don't wait for them to worsen don't just give vitamin c and tell them to wait no start antiviral oral medication give ivermectin give uh, ecosprin see if you would start this three drugs the most of the complications 99% of the patients will recover that's where we are erring in approaching this positive cases in karnataka there's a lot of dissonance because now the government is telling uh, doctors how to treat the patients you know should the government be deciding when the ventilator should be used or whether the high nasal flow oxygen should be used should it decide when remdesivir should be used should we decide when steroids should be given or not how isn't it up to the doctors to decide this what is your opinion dr prasanna uh, it's very preposterous and foolish on the part of the bureaucracy and karnataka government to do this actually see they are sitting in air conditioned chambers and making these policies the ground reality is different and each patient and individual is different they react in a different way to the covid uh, exposure and the treatment protocols have to be customized and the treating physician in that ward and who is heading the treatment protocol should be the boss you should not go by the protocols like you give oxygen only when they come below 85 or 90 no he he has a thinking mind he knows which patient gets into problem which patient needs what treatment and he should be the boss to decide not somebody sitting and making these rules they can only give a guideline that's all they should not tell you stick to this that never works even in the united states the even though the uh, american physician academy has given the guidelines the treating physicians are still the bosses who decide what is required for that patient that's why the complication rates will go high if you follow these guidelines they tell to start a hfnc for a particular patient you take approval from an adc what does an adc know about the patient he is sitting somewhere the treating doctor is the one who decides whether a patient needs hfnc or he needs a bipap ventilator or he needs only a nrbm mask the scenario is totally different so you need to give a free hand and trust our physicians you can't distrust our own there may be black sheep one or two in the community there's there in every field but 99% of the physicians want their patients to live and go home so whatever they do they do in the interest of the patient so when to give a remdesivir you can't tell give it to only icu patient they don't benefit by the time it's already late the lung involvement is more than 50% they go to icu you give remdesivir it won't work patients who are mild to moderate who are bound to get into a problem who crp is high d dimer is high on admission they, these are the patients who need remdesivir and they all revert very well without complications so the 
Treating physician is the foremost and he is the king there. He should decide what is required for the patient. Let me go back to January when you had begun talking about a problem in the supply of oxygen. You said the cost of transporting oxygen has becoming much more than the cost of oxygen. So why did you not amplify this concern at that point, uh, Dr. Prasanna? Why, it's already four months since then. Why did you not amplify this issue that supply of oxygen is going to be a big problem? See, I brought this across in for various forums. We wrote to the health ministry also at that time. Then I wrote to the central minister also at that time. Then the government came out with the regulation of prices for transportation cost also. There is a notification from the central government. But it's of no use. Unless it is implemented to the world, nobody is following that. See, the transportation cost has been fixed between 7.5 rupees to 9 rupees per cubic meter. But people are charging 20, 25 rupees per cubic meter. Who is controlling them? Who is keeping a tab on them? Now, uh, I brought, because now we are all facing shortage of supply. Nobody is talking about the cost of transportation and other things. Now, the paramount interest is to get oxygen to our patients. Whether we make a profit or loss is tomorrow we will see that. Now, because there is a huge demand for liquid oxygen and short supply, we are unable to bring these issues to the forefront. We are, we are facing the acute shortage of liquid oxygen. Still, the supply to medium and small hospitals is very erratic. Every third day or fourth day, every other hospital is facing this shortage where we are left with only a few hours of oxygen. So, somewhere I have been telling this micromanagement of the supply chain is what is important and that has been overlooked. Nobody is bothering about it. They are fighting at how much uh, liquid oxygen should come to the state. But whatever we are getting, how we are using it, we have to use it wisely and every drop of that liquid oxygen is important. It should be used properly to reach the patients. That's what has not been. Now, this seems to be a very huge problem providing the right treatment. So it also highlights serious condition of, of our public health system. Do you think there is a solution for this and what can be done to get around this problem? At least for the time being, what is the solution? And going further down the line, what should be the big picture that we look at? See, uh, right now what we need to do in a war footing is we need to increase the number of critical care beds wherever it is possible, either in the public or in the private. We, the officers have to get onto the field. They should not sit in their offices and work. They should visit every hospital, talk to the management, look into the infrastructure, how these critical care beds can be increased. With that, whether we can give adequate supply of oxygen to this hospital, how do we manage that supply chain and where to get the human resources to support them. Every hospital has, uh, is working only with 50 to 60 percent of the staffing right now. We are already short. And how do we augment that? We provide them with the final year students. We provide them with some science graduates who can be trained to do some back-end jobs. Uh, these are the things which need to be done in a war footing. It needs to become decentralized. The whole uh, planning needs to come to the hospitals and to the public sector hospitals where they should sit and plan it out, not in sitting in Vidana Soda or in the secretariat. That's where we are suffering. And third is make sure that the testing has to go up again. We need to test more number of people. And again, the problem right now is in the rural sector. Bangalore, somehow as the infrastructure has reached, uh, we can manage it. The cases are coming down. But we are seeing a time bomb exploding in the rural sector where it has to become more robust. We need to do more testing. These are the patients who don't have access to good quality health care. Their lives have to be taken care of. This is the need of the R right now. How many members do you have in your association, uh, doctor? How many hospitals and nursing homes? See, in Bangalore, we have 500 members uh, who are under the KPMA registration, including the big chain hospitals are our members. Across Karnataka, we have 6,000 hospitals. We have district chapters in every district. And these district chapters are members of Fala Karnataka. How much are you all willing to cooperate with the government? You talked about how these officials have to go to these hospitals and check each hospital. At this point, wouldn't it save time if you had a centralized dashboard and the hospitals voluntarily agreed to make it more transparent 
Even big hospitals have been pulled up now for falsifying data about the number of COVID beds availability. So do you think there should be more transparency, more honesty and a better cooperation between the government and the private sector? Yes, FANA stands for that. We need to be very honest and transparent in declaring our bets. See, there is no doubt about it. See, as long as we are transparent in our declaration, the government will also cooperate. And we follow that philosophy that all our hospitals are with the government in this fight against the COVID. It's a national disaster because we are seeing our own kith and kin suffering. We are seeing our relatives. We are seeing our friends dying. So all of us are together with this. There is no doubt that the private sector is not shouldering the responsibility with the government. It's the government and the, pub, uh, the private partnership which has to go hand in hand. They have to trust us. We need to trust the government. And already a lot of bills are piling from the private sector to the government. Even the government needs to reimburse those at a, a faster pace. Even the previous waves bills are still pending. So the private sector is having a slight distress whether we are going to get reimbursed or not. So the government should have cleared all the backlog by this time. So private sector would have been more than willing to give more the, the more number of beds. That's where the distress factor has come. So they sometimes they hesitate to declare the number of beds, thinking that if it goes to the government pool tomorrow, you may not get that payment or not. So this has to be cleared by somebody higher up. The leadership has to be, it has to work with conviction. They have to take the private sector into confidence, telling that, yes, what may come, I will be there with you. We'll see to that every bill is reimbursed. That kind of uh, assurance is required from the government. Then it goes a long way in uh, taking this COVID. I'm just reading out a message from one of our viewers. says that uh, recently at a hospital, he saw parents abandoning their son because they could not pay for the treatment. And when he eventually died, they left the son's body with the daughter-in-law and a one-year-old child. What happens then? Who pays those bills? See, uh, the government of Karnataka has a ruling in the KPME Act. Any patient dies in a private hospital, uh, the bill will be paid by the government of Karnataka. There is a provision for that. These hospitals have to notify the nodal officer, even if it is a private uh, category patient, that certain this patient is died. And that bill will be reimbursed by the government at the government rates. So there is a provision for that. And uh, if somebody is in a dire state, they are unable to pay, uh, the government will take care of it. But there is a lot of paperwork involved. But we need to do this for our citizens. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today, Dr. Prasanna. Really appreciate you giving your time. And I know you're very busy with uh, your own hospital duties. Thank you so much. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Access to healthcare is the right of all citizens. Can the government provide it? And can the government make available free treatment to all patients suffering from COVID-19? Let's discuss this in another episode in the next few days.